Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to cover a very important concept, for loops and while loops. We'll cover different examples to give you clear understanding from the very basic to somewhat interesting problems that can be solved using loops. And we'll also give you enough understanding of the loops so that you can apply this to a given data. Let's get started. First of all, to build some intuition, let's understand how these two types of loops are different. Let's say you're in the process of relocation, right? So you call a professional packers and movers who are going to load everything into boxes. Now, if you've been living at a place for a while, you wouldn't exactly know how many boxes you need, but you have to get started. So these people will get started. They'll continue to load boxes to help you in getting all the items loaded into these boxes. And at that stage, their work is half done. This process where you don't exactly know the number of boxes you needed, but you knew the condition that every single item that belongs to you should be loaded, that's when you are dealing with while loops. What I mean to say is that while loops are really efficient when you don't really know the number of times you want to perform a task, but you want to perform a task repeatedly until a condition is reached. On the other hand, once you've loaded your items, your belongings into a truck, and now you are in the process of unloading to wherever you've relocated. At this stage, you know the exact number of boxes that are there in the truck. And you would call the unloading complete when the last box is unloaded. So in these cases, when you exactly know the number of boxes that you want to unload, you are dealing with something that's known as a for loop. So once again, a subtle difference. In case of a while loop, you may not necessarily know the number of times you have to run a task you may know that you'll finish when you reach a condition. Whereas in case of for loop, you may be running it over a data structure. You want to go over an entire list. In this case, you can compare the truck with the list. So you know how many boxes are there in the container and you will finish when the container is empty. With this, let's get started with some hands-on and understand this with the help of some examples. All right, so I bring you to the Jupyter notebook and I already have the typed examples it's just that I'll focus on explaining every single line that's written here so that you build proper understanding of these loops. And we will continue to work on every example alternating between for and while loops so that you're able to compare these two at the same time. Let's say we have a list. In our previous video, we've covered what are lists. These are the collection of variables. And let's say we have a list which is related to some scores. So we have these scores attained by different students in a given subject. And these are the seven numbers that we have. If I want to access any element of a list, I can do that. I'll have to do indexing. So if I say list zero, remember Python follows zero indexing. So it's, it would give me the value 80, which is the first value. If I say list three, it means zero, one, two, and three. So it will return 75, right? This way we can do indexing on a list. Let's start with the most simple example related to loops. Let's say we want to go over this entire list that we just saw, and we want to go over it one item at a time. So in this case, we can call a for loop, and you can see these words in green are actually the keywords in Python. So we are saying for i in list one. List one was the name of the list, and i could be anything. We can write any name, any alphabet. What is i? i is a general reference to all these scores that are contained in the list. So let's say if we execute this, you would see that we have the entire list printed. It goes through every item in the list one by one. So it starts with item zero, which will be the first item in the list and prints it. Goes to the second item and prints it and so on and so forth until it reaches the end. So this is like you knew the list, you knew the list has seven items and you refer to the list. It executes one item after the other until it reaches the end. Okay, how different would be a while loop? Let's have a look at it. For a while loop, you will have to first initiate this value of i, let's say with a zero in this case. While loop is based on a condition. Until a condition is reached, it will continue to execute. So we are saying while i is less than the length of the list. What is the length of the list? If I were to quickly show you, the length of the list is nothing but the total number of items that are present in the list. So these are seven items. So until it reaches the last value, it will continue to execute. It will continue to refer to every single item of the list and print it out. Remember, we have put a counter in this case, which is where we are saying that I should be incremented by one after the task is completed. 
If you don't do this, it will continue to run till infinity. When the first task is executed, we will put i is equal to one for the next iteration. Only then at some stage, it will reach a value which is less than seven. So when you write less than seven, it means the final value that will take here for i will actually be a value of six. The moment it reaches seven, it'll say no longer the seven is less than the length of the list. So it will terminate. Whereas if we would have not incremented this one after the other, it will continue to work with i as zero and will run till infinity. If you happen to have done that, then you need to go to the kernel and do an interrupt or restart. Let me just execute it for now. This should work absolutely fine. And as you can see, this result is exactly the same as that we got from the for loop. Let's take another example now, which is to create a multiplication table. So let's say I have a number for which I want to see a multiplication table from one to 10. We are coding it in the form of a for loop right now. We're saying for i in the range one to 11. Now range is a function again, which will take the first value as you mentioned, but n minus one at value for the value at the end. So if you're putting an 11 here, it's going to take 10. Then we are printing and we're doing a bit of formatting. So we are saying we would want to print the number that we are passing and these are the strings. So it will show a multiplication sign and an equal to sign, and it will show these different values of i in the range one to 11. And finally, it will return the product of the number and the value of i. So let's just run this, right? So you see that this is giving you a table of five. Now you might think that this is very easy. Why are we making a computer do all of this? Well, what if I was to ask you a table of 343? You might think about it, but a computer wouldn't take much time to think. So this is easy to program. Let's try to do the same task using a while loop. Again, we are passing a number. We are mentioning a point where we want to initiate. So when we look at a table, we always start with a one. We don't start with a zero. That's why we're passing a value of one here. And we are saying it should run until this i reaches the value of 10. And look at this, we're putting an equality here. So we want to reach up to 10 while incrementing i in this case. So again, this is just the output structure and we are continuing to increase it. So it starts with one, goes on to two, then three, until it reaches 10. And the moment it reaches 10, after that, when it comes back, it would see that the condition is not satisfied and it wouldn't execute any further. So you get the same output again. If you want to get a complex table, let's say we change it to any number, you get it in a few seconds here. Let's take another example. Let's say from a list of numbers, we have to find the odd and even numbers. So how do we do this in this case? Very simple. We are actually going to mix a loop here with something that's known as conditionals. So we are putting certain conditions here. We are saying that for i in range one to 10, which means one to nine, if i is divisible by two and that value, when you do a modulus operator, as we discussed in our previous video, it returns the remainder. If remainder is zero, and notice double equal to here means the real equality. A single equal to in Python is an assignment, just like you create a variable and you put a value, assign a value to it. That's called assignment with a single equal to. Double equal to here means the equality. So what we are saying is that if a number divided by two returns a remainder, which is zero, which means it is an even number, right? So that's what we want to print. Otherwise we are saying, print that it is an odd number. Let's say if we execute this, what happens? So it tells us, right? You can do this for any range of values. You can modify this and get any range of value. If we have to do the same thing using a while loop, how is it that we're going to do that? So we'll say we'll have to initiate i with a value first of all, and it doesn't have to be i only. I'm just calling it as a general reference. You can write it anything, any name also that you want to give it. While i is less than or equal to 10, so which means we want it to be executed till 10. If i divided by 2 results into a remainder that is 0, print even, otherwise print, it is an odd. Notice that the earlier one that we ran was still 9, and this one we are running is still 10. So there's a slight difference. You can just change it yourself. If you, if you wanted to run it 10 times, you can just modify the last value to 11, and then it will run 10 times. Now exact same output. Now let's take an interesting problem, and this is a bit tricky. Let's say we want to separate the prime and composite numbers. So let's understand what are prime numbers, first of all. So our prime number is a number that's divisible only by one and by itself. And by definition, one is not a prime number. The smallest prime number is two. 
Prime numbers are not generally defined as negative numbers. So these are all positive numbers starting from two, but the condition one should be satisfied. It should be only divisible by one and by itself. All right, so let's see how we code it. So we have to separate the non-prime and prime numbers for a given range. To start with, we are taking a range from two to 100, right? So when I say range two to 101, it means the lower value is inclusive and the upper value minus one is inclusive, right? We are creating two empty lists to contain the non-prime and the prime numbers. Non-primes are basically the composite numbers which are made up of prime numbers. So if I say 24, you can write 24 as two into two into two into three. So eight times three is 24, right? But prime number is something, for example, let's say if I say seven, so you can divide seven only by one or by itself. You can't divide it by any other number in between. So we are creating two empty lists which will contain or store the non-prime and prime numbers as we intend to separate them. And we are giving a range of values from two to 100. Now we are doing something called as nesting here, which is a loop within a loop. We are running another for loop within this with a range from two to number. Notice when I say two, this will be included, but when I say number, it will be number minus one. So what we've done is we have taken the values excluding one and up to the number minus one. So if a number is divisible by any other number in the range, two to n minus one, it won't be prime. Think about it. We said it is only divisible by one and itself. And we've excluded those possibilities here. We are saying we'll take all the values from two to number minus one. And if that results, if this is I, and if I divide the number as I took with I and I get the remainder as zero, it means it is a non-prime number. And then we are doing a break. So what is a break? Break means that stop the execution. Even if once you encounter that a given I can divide a number perfectly, you should stop execution. It proves that the number is not a prime number. Else, we will call it a prime number. So let's say if we execute this and we are just separating the prime and non-prime numbers. We are saying if so is the case, then append the number into the list of non-primes. Otherwise, append the number into the list of, append is a method that can be applied to lists. So append the number to the list of prime numbers. Let's see what happens, right? So these are the numbers from two to 100, which are non-prime. And you can see, you know, all of these numbers are divisible by several prime numbers, right? So for example, 77, it's divisible by seven and 11, right? But these are all prime numbers. Now, the beauty of this is, that if you want to change the range, let's say you want to change it from 150 to 301, this will return you the prime and non-prime numbers in that given range. And that's where coding is powerful, right? Because with a small change, you can get the results as you would want. Why? Because we are using loops and loops are a very efficient way to do a task which is repetitive in nature. Let's try to do the same thing with a combination of while and a for loop. So we can do all sort of nestings. We can do a while loop within a while loop, and we can do a combination of a for and while loop. Here we are taking a while loop and inside it, we are passing a for loop, right? So what are we saying? We are saying that we will initiate number with two because smallest prime number is two, right? And we are capping it for an equality of 100, which is equivalent to a range of 101, right? So this is 100. Again, the same condition is explained. So we are checking for the divisors, which will range between two to the number minus one, both inclusive. Even if for one of these numbers, this condition is satisfied that you get a remainder zero, it will be a non-prime number and we want to append it that way. Otherwise, we will append it to the prime numbers and it's going to give us the same results. Remember, this is a range that we have written here from two to 100. If you want to modify this here, and this here, you can do that. You'll get all of this that I'm doing here as the reference material. You can always continue to practice. All of these are good to know pieces, but how do we actually use it when we are working on a data? So for that purpose, I'm going to use the data set which is available within the Seaborn package. For this, I'm calling two important libraries. One is Pandas as PD and Seaborn as SNS. This is just to access the data frame. I'm loading a data set which we've used for our interactive visualization video earlier, which you might have seen. So we are loading the data set here. This is called the MPG data set. It is available within Python environment. So you don't have to have a CSV file or an Excel file for this, right? So I'm just loading that and let me show you the data. So this is how the data is, right? 
right now, if I show you the information relative to this data, you would see that this data has a mix of data types. So it has some floats, ints, which are numerical values, and it also has some objects, which are factors. If you know the background of this data, this is about the mileage of some cars, and these are the features relative to the cars. So cylinders, what is the displacement, which is the volume of the cylinders, the horsepower, the weight of the car, the acceleration model year, and the origin, country, continent, information like that. So let's see how we utilize a loop here to do some repetitive calculations. So let's say we call a for loop and we are calling it over all the columns of this data frame. Let me show you what it means. So when I say df dot columns, it actually returns a list inside these square brackets, as you can see, of all the features that are present in the data. So we are going to run a for loop over all these columns one by one. And in order to filter the relevant columns, because we're going to perform some arithmetic operations, which do not make sense on categorical data. So we are saying if the data type of a given column is not equal to, so this exclamation and equal to sign is not equal to an object type, which means if it is not a categorical column, we just want to print the standard deviation. So th these are the methods. You can just put the column name DFI, is the general reference. I here can be MPG in quotes, then cylinders again in quotes and so on and so forth. And you can continue to execute for all the numerical columns here. So we are calculating the standard deviation and rounding it up to two decimal places. This is a round function, which is going to limit the value that we get to two decimal places. Calculating the mean, calculating the coefficient of variation, which is nothing but a ratio of the standard deviation and mean. And let's see when I executed, what is it we get? So quickly, you get this information for all the variables that are meaningful. Ignore it for the variable year because it may not make sense to calculate the standard deviation and average for the year. But for other columns, it is somewhat meaningful, right? If, you, if you're concerned about the presence of outliers and all, we've covered that in a separate video. So don't worry about it right now. This is just to demonstrate that if you have to do a repetitive calculation, this for loop comes to a risk. Let's say we want to do the same thing using a while loop. So we are going to in initiate the value of i, which is any column in that list, which contains the names of the columns. But remember, in while, you have to give a condition where it stops. So we are saying that this value of i will stop at a stage when it reaches the end of the columns. Again, the condition, which is the variable shouldn't be an object. And these are the calculations. Please remember, in a while loop, you also have to put a counter which has to show a movement. So in this case, it is incrementing. Since we have put a strict inequality here, the moment this i reaches a value equal to the length of the number of columns that we have, this will stop. So if we don't write it again, it'll start running an infinite loop. Let's execute it now. We are incrementing it and this code seems appropriate. And if I execute, you quickly get the standard deviation mean and the coefficient of variation. All right, so this covers some examples of for and while loops. We started from the very basic and went up to a stage where we could apply it to a data. If you happen to have liked this video, please ensure that you subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends and all those who might benefit. As we say, learning gets multiplied when it is shared. Thank you.